All right, I think we're online. <laughs> Yay! Yay! And if you don't know, if you couldn't hear us or see us, it doesn't matter because you don't know anyway. So, <laughs> and you guys already know, I'm Dr. Kenneth Hyatt. This is Pastor Cindy Hyatt. This is Seeds of Victory Global Bible Study. We're glad you're here. We are so, glad you're here. If you can see us, if you can hear us, mm -hmm. let us know. Let us know how the video and all of the audio is. We had a little bit of trouble uh, getting started, a little bit of hassle. So let us know and give us some feedback, okay? So just do that right quick. I would appreciate it. Okay, and we have guests with us tonight. We have Lucille back with us tonight. Yay! And we have a very special guest, Maxine, and her grandson, Joel, are with us. Yay! And it's going to be good tonight. Y'all get we your notebook and pencil out and your Bible out. You're yes. going to want to take yes, notes. Yes, yes, yes. Because the Lord woke Kenneth up in the wee hours this morning and gave him a new message. And as you know how it goes, he preaches on Sunday. And then on Tuesday, it's a repeat except in Bible study format. Except tonight, it's not going to be what he yeah, preached it's Sunday. Yeah, going to be a different, little different deal. So if you want to know what he preached no, I'll Sunday... Share bit, I'll share a little bit more about that later. Yeah. So. But if you want to know what he preached Sunday, you have to get the CD. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So <laughs> For only 1995. Yeah, <laughs> only, only. Only uh, No, we're going to do a special today, 1595. <laughs> yeah. Getting any response and we've got that. Lisa, and we've got Brady Bunch. And we've got Roy and Mary Jo. Yay. And we've got, let's see, who else, who else, who else? Burl. Hey, Burl. And America. And let's see. Um, <laughs> Burl says, I see you. It's just like romp room. <laughs> Where's she my mirror? She doesn't have her magic mirror. <laughs> I don't have my magic mirror. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Good. If you guys can see us and hear us, we're doing great because we had a little bit of trouble. Uh, getting started, so yay! I'm We're good. We're up and going. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. We're good. Uh, let me share a little bit some stuff on the website. Um, first of all, um, I'm going to leave the series, the free monthly series. I'm going to leave it the same for October. If you didn't get a chance to get that. Go online, get it. Free series, free download, MP3, uh, talking about the reciprocal. Of the love of God, the the um, oh, I'm just going blank on my own stuff, but uh, the reciprocal the reciprocal of the love of God. Um, anyway, get the series <laughs> five CDs. I have to go to the website it's to so, see. <laughs> it's so good, I forgot what it was. I forgot uh, what it was called. Yeah, mm -hmm. But we're, I'm leaving that up again for October. Also, uh, I've got set up a Facebook page. This is called a secret Facebook page, and I, we will all blame Carl for this. Uh, because it was Carl's idea. What what Carl was interested in was having a Facebook page that is strictly for uh, the Seeds of Victory Global Bible Study family so that prayer requests, uh, sharing, preaching, all of that, it would strictly be for the Bible study group. So uh, we went to work on that and Trixie set up the page. And... So we've got that all set up, and it's it's called a secret Facebook page. That's not my terminology. That's Facebook's. A secret Facebook page is exactly that. You can't find it by searching for it. You can't find it on Google search. If you happen to be part of it and you send somebody a link to that page, it'll be grayed out. You cannot get on there unless you're approved by an administrator to be on there. So we've got it all set up. All the information is on the website. So you can go to the website. You can click on It's right up in the very top where you can see it. Click on the, on the page. It just says, are you interested in the Seeds of Victory Family Facebook page? Click on that link. It'll give you the information. It'll give you the instructions. And we've got three administrators. Uh, You'll send an email to, to them, which we're two of them, obviously, and a third one. And we check the emails. We get you online, and then you're notified on Facebook. Once you're, once you're part of the group, then you can find us by Facebook search, and you will receive a notification that you are now part of the group. And it's, it's kind of... Anyway, go read the instructions, because we're, we're trying very hard to stay in balance between 
letting everybody on there that wants to be on there and at the same time being uh, exclusive from the standpoint of protecting everybody's privacy and whatnot. But, you know, it's, it's basically a carryover from the conference. And where mm -hmm. everybody can just get together online and chat mm -hmm. and and exhort one another and pray for one another and and all of that. So, go to the website and get the information on that and join up. And if you sign up, then uh, one of us will check the email. I've got an email account set aside specifically for that. We'll check that. We'll get you put in the group. So. Uh, if you got any questions on that or whatever, we'll just let us know and we'll get you fixed up. So, we got anything? Trixie made it. Yay! Good, Trixie. Hey, I'm glad Trixie. you made it on. And Lisa says, hello, get no, she says, hi, guests. No. They're in the <laughs> church. <laughs> Lisa says, hi. <laughs> what we gave our uh, she, yeah. uh, Lisa, they gave the princess wave. <laughs> well, this is, this is going to be very interesting tonight. Um, Cindy was saying earlier that ordinarily, of course, you guys that come to Victory Harvest, you already know that usually I'll take Sunday notes, share them on Sunday night, and then we kind of get into commentary, and it goes all kinds of different directions. Um, but the Lord um, woke me up about 3.30 this morning, and I went in and started praying a little bit, got in the Word a little bit, and, and the Lord gave me a message, and to be honest with you... Um, I'm going to share this thing by faith because I don't I, I I preach what I'm told. I don't you know I don't pre-plan and all that you know six weeks in advance. Whatever the Lord gives me to say, that's that's mm -hmm. what I endeavor to do. And so the Lord gave me this message, and so I, I've been working on this all day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you're going to find it very interesting. But again, I'm I'm doing this by faith because I don't know specifically who it's for, what it's for. But whoever it's for, I believe they'll watch it, they'll see it, they'll hear it, whether it's one of you guys live online or, uh, you know, somebody watching on the archives. It could be Patrick in the U.K. or somebody in the U.K. or whatever, you know, that, that this is for. Um, but just for the sake of you guys making notes, if you want to do title or whatever, I've titled this The Key to the Supernatural. And so that's what we're going to look at, what we're going to, going to deal with. So, we ready to go? I think we are. All right. Well, let's pray and we'll get started. Father, in the name of Jesus, yes, I just come before you. I thank you for this opportunity to share your word with your people. And Father, I thank you yes, in Lord. Jesus' name for the spirit of wisdom and revelation being made manifest. I set myself in agreement with mm -hmm. what Cindy has already pray, uh, prayed. I thank you, yes, Father, Lord. in Jesus' name mm -hmm. that your will be done. In Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. Amen. 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 All right, let's go over to a scripture that we've been looking at for several weeks, using it as a springboard. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 30. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 30. Of course, you guys online have been with us, and so there's a couple of things that I'm going to say and just just in passing, I don't have time to elaborate. Uh, if you want to deal with some of the statements that I make, you can go back in the archives and watch. But I'm just going to make a couple of comments and keep moving forward because we've got a lot of ground to cover in this tonight. And we're going to be le reading a lot of Scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Let's begin reading. Verse 15. God is speaking through Moses. And he says, See, I have set before you this day life and good and death and evil, and that I command you this day to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways and to keep His commandments and His statutes and His judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if your heart turn away so that you will not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that you shall surely perish and that you shall not prolong your days upon the land, whether thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, 
that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. That thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey His voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto Him. For He is your life and the length of your days. That you may dwell in the land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. Now, back up here to verse 16. Or verse 15, let's read into it. He said, See, I have set before you this day life and good and death and evil in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God. Now, I want you to notice how this is put together. He said, I've put before you life, death, blessing, cursing in that I command you. So, this decision, this crossroads that Israel is at right at this moment is rooted in God's commandment. He said, I have set before you this day life and good and death and evil in that I command you. Anytime you receive a commandment from God, it demands a decision. I have set before you life and good and death and evil in that I command thee this day. To love the Lord thy God. So here they are commanded to love God. Now we've already talked about this a great deal over the past several weeks, so I'm just going to remind you of it. You'll remember G there were some uh, Pharisees that came to Jesus, a Pharisee that came to Jesus and said, ask him the question, what is the greatest commandment? And he said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And the second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You can read that in Matthew 22, uh, 35 through 40. And he said, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So the law and the prophets is fulfilled in the commandment to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, something that we've already talked about in great detail, obviously, we are not under the law, we are under grace. And we've looked at the Scripture already that, uh, and talked about the fact that under the Old Covenant, the nation of Israel was commanded to love God. Here, they are commanded to love the Lord their God. Under the New Covenant, we are not commanded to love God. Under the New Covenant, we are commanded to believe that God loves us. And as we believe that God loves us, then we will love God by response. Share this scripture again in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19. says, we love Him. Why? Because, because he, he first, first loved, us. loved us. So under the old covenant, the servants of God were commanded to love God. Under the new covenant, we as sons of God under grace are commanded to believe that God loves us and we love Him in return by response. But now here's the thing. Whether you're living under the Old Covenant or living under the New Covenant, it really doesn't make any difference. Regardless of the covenant that you are under, we are still required by God to walk in, uh, to walk in obedience. Obedience is absolutely necessary for the blessing of God. Again, let me give you this scripture online. Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, He said, Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Also, Luke, John chapter 14 and verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Amen. So, regardless of whether we're, you're dealing with people under the Old Covenant or people under the New Covenant, in order to walk in the blessing of God, we must walk in obedience. Obedience is the key ingredient to the blessing of God. So again, he said here, See, I have set before you this day life and good and death and evil. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God. Life and death, blessing and cursing is centered up in the commandment of God. Consequently, life and death, 
blessing and cursing, is centered up in our obedience. Now, we have talked about the fact that the blessing of God is on us because of the sacrifice of Jesus. Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, mm -hmm. as it is written, Cursed is everyone, everyone that hangeth on a tree. tree. Mm -hmm. For what reason? Verse 14, That, that the, the blessing, blessing of Abraham, of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through, Christ, through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So Jesus went to the cross for the purpose of, of making the blessing of God available. Again, we've looked at this in our Bible study, Ephesians 1, 3. says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, past tense, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The blessing of God is on us because of the sacrifice of Jesus. But now here's the deal. Um, just because you have the blessing of God on you does not mean that the blessing of God is activated. That's very important. Uh, Y'all were talking earlier about computers and, uh, you know, talking about computer hassles and all that kind of stuff. You guys know that you can, you can see a program that you want or put one on your computer, uh, download it from the Internet or whatever the case may be, and you can even install the thing and have it put on your computer and it's there, but many times that program will not be activated until you put in a code or, you know, do something to activate that program and make it work. Well, that's the way the blessing of God is. We are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly mm -hmm. places in Christ Jesus. Amen. That has been made available to us through the sacrifice of Jesus. But there is something that we have to do to activate that blessing in our lives, and what we have to do is walk in obedience. So obedience activates the blessing of God. The Apostle Paul said it this way in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 25. Galatians 5.25, he said, If we live in the Spirit, well, let me just tell you, if you've been born again, you live in the Spirit. You live in the Spirit realm. But he said, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk, walk. in the mm -hmm. Spirit. Yes. See, you can live in the Spirit and still walk in the natural. Yes. But when you live in the Spirit, then you also have to walk in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit is activating the blessing of God on your life. And that's what we're talking about. And again, the way you activate the blessing of God on your life is through obedience. So let's read verse 15 again. He said, See, I have set before you this day life and good, death and evil, and that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in His ways, and to keep His commandments and His statutes and His judgments that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whether thou goest to possess it. Now, we did this last week, but let's do this again. Which one do you choose? <laughs> Make the choice. Do you choose yeah. life or do you choose death? Mm -hmm. Do you choose uh, the blessing or do you choose the curse? Well, if you're in your right mind, you're going to choose life and you are going to choose the blessing mm -hmm. of God. I want to show you something. This is what the Lord woke me up and started talking to me about uh, this morning. I want to show you, and we're going to read a lot of Scripture. In fact, we're going to read a couple of whole chapters here. Uh, I want to show you a man out of the Old Testament that made the wrong choice. So go with me now to 1 Samuel chapter 15. We got any questions or comments or anything uh, so far? Let's see. Lisa chooses the blessing in life. Amen. <laughs> Yay. Amen. Good choice. Anybody else joined us? Robert's here. Hey, Robert. And Yay, Pam, Pam is it. here. Hey, Pam. Yay. So glad you're I'm here, glad Pam. You made it. Awesome. All right. First Samuel chapter 15. We're gonna we're going to go through this whole chapter. I'm laying a groundwork here for some things. First Samuel chapter 15. Let's begin. 
with verse 1. Thank you, Lord. Said Samuel also said unto Saul, Saul, of course, is the king of Israel. He said, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and spite Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Now do you get the instruction there? Wipe out everything. Now God, God makes reference here to what happened when Israel came out of, out of Egypt. You can go back and read it in Exodus chapter 17. What happened was, I mean, they were fresh on the other side of the Red Sea. They had just come out of Egypt. They hadn't even made it to Sinai yet. And they are progressing toward Mount Sinai. And as they're going toward Sinai, they are attacked by the Amalekites. And you can read in Exodus chapter 17. It's, it's a very interesting story. And Israel, of course, eventually won the battle. It was a very difficult battle. But God was very, very upset with what the Amalekites did because there's three reasons God was <laughs> really bent out of shape. One of, a, one of them was the fact that when they attacked Israel, the attack was unprovoked. They did, Israel did absolutely nothing to deserve the attack of the Amalekites. Secondly, it was an undeclared war. What we, the way we would term it today would be a terrorist attack. I mean, just out of the blue, out of nowhere, mm -hmm. wham, they were attacked. So it was an undeclared war. And number three, if you study it out a little bit, you will find it was an attack from behind. They hit them at their weakest point. And probably the closest thing we would have here in the history of the United States would be Pearl Harbor. I mean, just out of nowhere, here came Japan you know, totally, deliberately unprovoked attack against the United States. That's what happened with Israel. And Israel won the battle and defeated the Amalekites that day. But as a result of that, God made a statement concerning that. Exodus chapter 17, verses 14 through 16 God said this after the battle was over. He made this declaration. said, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book. Write this down so it's not forget, forgotten. And rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. For he said, Because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Bottom line is, brother, you go to war with Israel, you are going to war with God. And would to God that a lot of the turban heads over in the Middle East right now would figure that out. It would save them a lot of heartache in the long run. Mm -hmm. But God said here about Amalek, He said, I will have war with them. And so now He speaks to Saul as king of Israel. As king, He would be the commander-in-chief. He would be the leader of the army. He would be the one that would direct the campaign. Verse 2 again. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, and how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. Spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. So this is serious business. And keep in mind what God told him to do. Wipe everything out. Verse 5. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Kenites, Go, depart, get you down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from, the, from among the Amalekites. And Saul smote the Amalekites 
from Havilah until thou comest to Shur, that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. Now I'll come back to that in just a second. Verse 9. But Saul and the people spared Agag. Now this is the king of the Amalekites. Spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuse that they destroyed utterly. Now here's a question. Is that what God told them to do? No. God didn't say, leave out the best for sacrifice. God said, you destroy it all, leave nothing, not cattle, not people, nothing. Wipe everything out. But he disobeyed God. Verse 10. Now, well, let me back up here because I want, want to bring this out again because you need to know this as well before we go any further. Verses 8 and 9 says, And took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. Now it says he destroyed all the people. Um, he did not wipe out the Amalekites as a race. He didn't wipe all of them out. Uh, this is what God intended for him to do. God intended for him to find everywhere you find an Amalekite, destroy them. This was to be an absolute, total genocide of the Amalekites. Now, he wiped out the, the people or the Amalekites that were in the villages that he went to. The problem was he didn't go to every village. He didn't fulfill his assignment the way God told him to do it. In fact, several centuries later, as a race of people... Uh, they were not wiped out until the days of Hezekiah. First Chronicles chapter 4 and verse 43, you have record of them being wiped out as a people. First Chronicles 4.43, this is in the days of Hezekiah, this is like three, four, five hundred years later, says, And they smote the rest of the Amalekites that were escaped and dwelt unto this day. Now, not only was the race wiped out, but it's very interesting because the very last Amalekite, the very last one, it's recorded in the Bible about him and his death. There's a man by the name of Haman. Esther chapter one and 3 and verse 1 says, After these things did, did King Ahasuerus promote Haman the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite. So he was an Amalekite. He was the last surviving person of his race. You can read the book of Esther's, Esther. He wound up being hung on his, on his own gallows. But for the whole race of the Amalekite people, uh, anti-Semitic, anti-God, and so God was saying, you wipe them out, Saul refused to do it. Now, we got any questions or comments or anything before we go any further? Mm -mm, nothing. Everybody's listening. Okay, good. Now, another, as far as Agag, uh, Saul was supposed to destroy him and they didn't. One of the Hebrew traditions, you can read it in the Talmud, that one of the reasons Samuel was so upset over the fact that he didn't destroy Agag, we're going to read this in just a minute, was the fact that during his time of captivity, he, he got hold of a woman, raped her, she became, uh, became pregnant, and the race continued. Now that's in the Hebrew Jewish Talmud. Now whether or not how legitimate that is, we don't know, but we do know that Saul did not fulfill his assignment. He did not do what he was supposed to do. Now, let's keep reading here. Verse 10 says, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me, and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, 
And behold, he set him up a place and is gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandments of the Lord. Now the guy is either a liar or deceived or both. Okay. I have performed the commandments of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowering of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way that which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. Very interesting. No repentance, but a whole lot of blame. Well, you know, <laughs> all these troops, all these people, well, they just wanted to sacrifice to the Lord. Is that what God said do? No. All right. Verse 22. This is, this is going to be a key as we get into this. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. We're going to get more into that in just a minute. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, He has also rejected you from being king. Verse 24. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. So you still hear the blame. You have no record of Saul ever repenting. Ever. Verse 25. He says, Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin, and turn again with me, that I may worship, worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned about to go away, he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord has rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and has given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord thy God. So Samuel turned again after Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. That's very interesting. Uh, because not only did he point the blame at the people, but he was so concerned at what the people thought. He knew he was in trouble with God, but it's be, Samuel. Why don't you? I mean, let's put on a show here, and, and so that the you know in front of the elders and whatnot. Verse thirty-two. Then said Samuel, "Bring ye hither to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites." And Agag came, and came unto him delicately, and Agag said, "Surely the bitterness of death is past." And Samuel said, As thy sword hath made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. And, and Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord, Lord in Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house to Gibeah, to Gibeah, of, to Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. Now, before we go any further, the question would be, how come this is such a big deal with God? I mean, why? I mean, okay, he disobeyed God. Um, he didn't do what God told him to do. 
But, you know, why was this such a big deal that Saul should have wiped out everything? Well, if you, if you study the history of Israel, you find that the Amalekites were a thorn in the side to the nation for hundreds of years, all the way up until Haman hanging on the gallows. And when I was looking at this, I, it reminded me of a documentary that I saw about World War II. And it, actually, World War I and World War II. And in this documentary... Uh, Adolf Hitler was a was a soldier in World War One, was a German soldier, and he was decorated for bravery, served very well in in uh, his unit. But during a particular attack, uh, the the Germans were going to go over the wall. They were going to attack the British, and they go over the wall. And Hitler's platoon goes over the wall, and they're going over the wall, and suddenly they're hit with a gas attack. The whole platoon is wiped out, except for Hitler. In fact, when it's all said and done, and as the, the gas and everything clears, Hitler is standing there in the open alone. And there is a British soldier, and I don't recall his name, but it's on record, uh, you know, like a, just this British sergeant, just, you know, Joe Blow from London or whatever. And he's standing there with his rifle, He's got Hitler in his sights. No one else is around. It's him and Hitler, and he's standing there with him point-blank range. And for some unknown reason, the guy lets his rifle down. Hitler runs off. One bullet would have changed history. Yes. <laughs> one bullet would have changed the 20th century. We would have had a totally different 20th century if... One decision. One decision, one bullet would have changed everything. It would have changed... Wow. How, how many millions of lives would have been saved by one bullet? Just one. Well, this is why God is so upset. If Saul would have been obedient and, and done what God told him to do, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the history of the nation of Israel would have been totally different mm -hmm. and would have been far better. But because of Saul's disobedience, uh, Israel suffered with it generation to generation to generation to generation. Mm -hmm. So that's why God was so upset and so angry. Now, we got any questions or anything? No questions, but Brenda's here. Okay. Hey, Brenda. Yay. I'm glad you're here. Wonderful. All right. God rejected Saul. Now, go down to chapter 16 with me. I'm building something here, so stay with me. Chapter 16, verse 13. This is the anointing of David. It says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Verse 14, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. There was a transfer of anointing. And it created a vacuum. The anointing moved from Saul to David. And to fill that vacuum, Saul now came under demonic influence. Now, God told him, he said, I will rend the kingdom from you. David was anointed when he was 17 years of age. And he didn't, David didn't begin to reign in Hebron until he was 30. So for 13 years, even though Saul, God had told Saul, you're going, to lose, you're going to lose the kingdom, it's going to be removed from you, Saul still ruled in Israel for 13 years, but he's ruling under a demonic spirit. He's ruling under demonic influence. Now, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 28. This is 13 years later. This is shortly before Saul's death.
First Carl. Samuel 28. Carl made it. Huh? Carl is here. Yay! Hey, Carl. All right. First Samuel 28, verse 3. It says, Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him, and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits in the wizards out of the land. Now this is when Saul was walking with God. I mean, there was a time where Saul had a campaign against all of the, the witches and so forth in Israel, got them out of the way. That was a good thing. Verse 4, And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in, in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together and they pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart greatly trembled. Verse 6, And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams nor by Urim, mm nor by the prophets. So here is a man that is a leader of the nation. He is under demonic influence. And God is not talking to him. You say, well, why doesn't God talk to him? Well, why bother talking to a person that won't listen to you and won't do what you say to begin with? You need to realize God is that way. And you, you continually resist God. You continually... You hear His voice, but you refuse to follow it. At some point, God will quit talking. There's no reason to speak to a person, talk to a person, instruct a person that won't listen, won't obey, and won't repent. Mm -hmm. and that's where this yeah. guy is. Mm -hmm. So why bother talking? Why bother saying anything about it? And, and I don't know, I've, I've made this statement through the years, but let me tell you, one of the beginning manifestations of the judgment of God is silence. Mm -hmm. That's, that's serious scary. Business. Oh, that's scary. That's serious business. Mm. And God is not saying anything to him. We've dealt with a lot of people through the years, and I've, I, there are so many times that I've sat there and listened to people, and they've said, well, you know, the Lord told me this, and I, the Lord told me that, and I'd sit there and think, Lord didn't tell you Lord that. Lord didn't tell you that. <laughs> and I'd say, Lord, you want me to say anything? No, they won't hear you. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. They don't have an ear to hear. Don't don't waste your breath. Yeah. Don't waste your breath. Mm -hmm. They're not gonna they're not gonna pay any attention to you. And they'll sit there and rattle off some ridiculous mess and you know God isn't any more in it than the man in the moon. God God they're wrong. You know it and I know it. God, you want me to say anything? No. <laughs> okay. Now, let me just say this. Uh, you got a question? Well, I, well, I just had a question. Okay. That verse six, what is your... Okay. In, okay. In fact, well, we, in fact, we kind of got off on this Sunday with a little bit of question and answer after the service. The Urim and the Thummim, there's still some debate about what that is. A lot of Bible scholars believe that it was a, it was a couple of rocks basically, and the high priest would take the, one was the Urim and the Thummim, and he had them in a pouch, and he would put them in the breastplate in a, in a uh, shirt, in like we call a shirt pocket, and we keep them next to his heart. And any time that David or one of the kings would inquire of the Lord, they would pull out these, these rocks. Now, a lot of Bible scholars believe that you would ask the Lord a question, Lord, should I go up? Should I go here? Should I do that, this or that? One rock represented no, one represented yes, and whichever one it was would light up. Now, that's, that's a lot of, of what is believed. Uh, another one would believe, well, you... And we got into this Sunday talking about lots, that they would leave it in the bag and you would draw and it would come up that way. So they're really not sure exactly how it was used, but what it was a picture of was being led by the inward witness. That's what it's a picture of, because the primary way God leads us is by the inward witness. And in the inward witness, you may not necessarily hear the voice of God. You know, we've talked about this before, that in the inward witness, if you say, Lord, do you want me to go to such and such? 
check on the inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, check inside your spirit. If you just kind of get all mm -hmm. curled up on the inside, you better back off. If you just, you know, uh, something's not right mm -hmm. here. My brother Hagen used to say, it's like washing your feet with your socks on. There's something here that just, it doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. You better wait. But if there is a sense of peace and conviction, and yes, I mm -hmm. believe God is in mm -hmm. this, and that is a picture in the spirit of the way God leads and guides. So God was not talking to Saul, either by the prophets or by the Urim, not by dreams. He wasn't talking to him at all. Now, we got any questions online or anything? No questions, but Lisa H. just made it. Hey, Lisa. Yay. So glad you made it, Lisa. Yay. Good. Okay. Mm. Yeah, do you remember what Thummim was? I don't recall. Truth. Truth? Okay, light and truth. Very good. Very, Very good. interesting. Light Very good. Truth. Very good. Repeat that because I probably didn't hear her. Okay, there yeah. If, light. Yeah, if, you, did, if yeah. you didn't hear, Urim means light. Thummim means truth. And I think of the scripture in Psalms, O Lord, send out thy light and truth. Let them mm -hmm. lead me and guide me. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yay! Thank Amen. you. Amen. Absolutely. Good. Good. So that was the way God God led us, mm -hmm. or or led them in the Old Testament. So nothing else so mm -hmm. far. No okay. questions. Okay. Um, let me say this before half of you get scared. <laughs> um, a lot of times we may have trouble hearing God. That doesn't mean He's not talking. That doesn't mean that judgment is set in and God's quit talking to you, okay? <laughs> so don't get all bent out of shape and nervous. But <laughs> Brother Hagen shared with us something, and I have found it to be just in absolute unshakable truth in walking with God, either in receiving revelation from the Word or in hearing from heaven on doing something. But he made this statement. He said, he said, if you're having trouble hearing God, he said, go back to the last thing you know God said because that's where you'll find Him. And that is the absolute truth. And really, that's where most, that's where most Christians have trouble hearing mm -hmm. God. It's not mm -hmm. like Saul where they're refusing to repent and all mm -hmm. that. Most Christians are repenting of everything they ever think of and thought of and you know, even a few things they never did. Just repent anyway because you're trying to hear from heaven. Mm -hmm. you know? And so if you're having trouble hearing God, go back to the very last thing God said and pick up from there. Because at some point you... you may have veered off a little bit. And another aspect of this to consider, and, and a lot of times you have to you have to pray in the Spirit uh -huh. and, and, and stay settled before God for a while because another thing Brother Hagin used to tell us was go as much by what God doesn't say as what He does say. You know, God is that way. A lot of times God will, God will give you an instruction Go do it. Yeah, well, God, but I want to know about all this, and I want to know about all, No, I told you to do this. Go, go do that. And a lot of times, God gives you information on a need-to-know basis. Why? Because you, we walk by faith and not by sight. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. So God will tell you what you need to know, but God will never give you so much information that it doesn't require that you step out on faith in some way. Mm -hmm. Okay? So... Um, this was not the case with Saul. And, and I want to differentiate here between you know where most Christians have trouble hearing God. It's not because the judgment of God has fallen. It's, it's for what, various and sundry reasons. Either uh, they've gone ahead of God or uh, they need to go back to the last thing God said or they need to get alone with God and spend some time listening to Him and so forth. I would say the last thing you just said is probably the number one reason people don't hear God. Don't take the time. They don't take the time to get quiet. They don't take the time to seek God. Mm -hmm. It's work to seek God. Mm -hmm. You've got to get your mind quiet. Yeah. You've got to shut everything out. You've got to get into the Word. You've mm -hmm. got to get into His presence. And sometimes that's just 
plain old hard work. It takes some work. It yeah. takes some discipline. And I think most people, I would say 99% of people don't hear God simply because they're not willing to make the investment to hear. Mm -hmm. That's why they'll listen to every preacher they can find to try to see if they can hear from God. Yeah. They don't trust their own spirit. Mm -hmm. And even when they do hear from some preacher, they're going to pick which one they like the best mm -hmm. when they really need to get settled well, we, down with God. We, we, we talked about this a few weeks ago on the Bible study. and I, and I In fact, I shared this with you on the conference where... Uh, Jesus' parents, you know, Jesus wound up in the temple at 12 years of age and they were looking for him for three days. And finally they found him in the temple and, it, they, and, and Jesus' response to them was, <coughs> you didn't know I was here? Mm -hmm. In other words, he was telling them, you should have known I would be here. And I shared with you guys, don't be like Jesus' parents. Quit looking for Jesus among all your friends and relatives. Quit asking everybody's opinion. Well, what do you think? 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 Well, what do you think I should do? Well, is the Lord telling you anything? No! Mm -hmm. Well, what's the Lord telling you? Well, what's the Lord telling you? Well, what's the Lord telling you? Well, what's He telling you? Mm -hmm. If you want to find Jesus, you're going to find Him in the temple. Where's the mm -hmm. temple? We are the temple mm -hmm. of the Holy Ghost. So right. if you want to hear from heaven for yourself, I'm, and again, we talked about this in the conference, I'm not saying don't seek godly counsel. In multitude of counselors, there's safety. Right. Go to people that know the Word. Go to the people that know God, and sure, get input, get feedback from them, but ultimately it's going to be you and Jesus mm -hmm. in the temple together. You're not for responsible heaven. for what yeah. Mama told you to yeah. do. Yeah, Mama Nim. <laughs> Mama Nim. You're responsible for what God told you to do. Mm -hmm. And what mom and them tell you should be a confirmation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you should already know. It should be a confirmation yeah, of what God has already told you. And if it's not, then back up and get in prayer and find out which direction in, to go. In fact, we you had a deal on Facebook the other day from Derek Prince. Somebody had shared it. And one of the things he brought out was how dangerous it was, for example to go try and seek words from prophets. Mm -hmm. That's a very dangerous thing. I saw that just thing. last yeah. week, I guess it very was. Very dangerous thing. That is not part of the operation of prophetic ministry in the New Covenant. Mm -hmm. The Bible does not say, for as many as are led by the prophets, they're the sons of God. It says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. That's right. We are responsible to hear from heaven for ourselves, and like you just said, whatever prof prophetic ministry comes about should be a confirmation of what you have in your spirit. And let me say this while I'm on this side track. You're not responsible for what's prophesied to you. That's you right. are responsible for what you have in your own spirit. That's right. So go with what you've got in your own spirit. Mm -hmm. Well, I could be wrong. You probably will be. However, if you are pursuing God to the best of your ability, He's big enough to make whatever corrections need to be made. So, anyway. That brings up... Seeking a word from a prophet. Back in the 80s, it was a big deal. Mm -hmm. They're pro prophets. Everybody and their sister was a prophet. Everybody and their sister suddenly <laughs> became a prophet. <laughs> they were everywhere. They came out of They're the woodwork. Everywhere. They were everywhere. <laughs> it's like, I've never seen so many prophets in my life. Well, like Kenneth has explained and taught all these many years, most of them were just people who were proficient in the gifts of the Spirit. Very few There's of them... There's a big them, difference between being proficient in the gift of prophecy and being a prophet and standing in that office. Two totally very, different Very, very different, and that's another teaching altogether. Yes. But there was a couple of different prophets that um, came to San Angelo on a pretty regular basis. There was a woman there in San Angelo that would have these prophets in in home meetings because these prophets didn't want to go to churches. They wanted to go to home meetings. Well, that would be your first clue. Yeah, but anyway. Authority issues, man. Yeah. Anyway, so there was a whole bunch of us from our church going over to some of these meetings. And 
myself, I was not there seeking a word. I was there observing, and we had so many people from our church going, I wanted to hear what was being said to them. Mm -hmm. As their pastor, I felt very responsible to know what was being said and done and what they were involved in. There was a woman in our church. Robert, you'll know who I'm talking about. She was in that meeting, and at that time, she had seven little kids. They were all just stair-step. Her littlest one was probably not even two years old. And this prophet walked over to her, and he said, I see the anointing of a nurse. You're a nurse. And God has called you to become an Aryan. And he goes into this long explanation of her being a nurse. And I'm standing there thinking, no, 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 no. Well, he gives her this long word about being a nurse and that God was going to take her out of her current situation, that she was going to have to leave everything aside and God had better things for her and he was going to give her a Cadillac. And Oh, I mean, it was just this long, drawn-out, <laughs> weird word. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord Jesus, oh, Lord Jesus. Well, of course, she was beside herself. What do I do? And I said, honey, forget it. All of it. Yeah. <laughs> forget all of it. She was so, she was suddenly just so afraid. Yeah. She had a house full of kids. <laughs> Walk off and leave all that? Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. And so anyway, that's just one of the things. Just, just seek God. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. hear yeah. from stay, God. Stay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Stay, stay with what God's talking about. Okay, we've got a All couple right. of things here. You got here. anything? Yes, ma'am. I've had the Holy Ghost almost 50 years, and I've only known two men that I knew was a prophet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But also, their prophecies and their ministry came to pass. I didn't make it. Absolutely. You do not make it come to pass. Exactly. Yes. And that's the danger that people... Mm -hmm. yes, Exactly. Yes. Oh, well, she's going to go to school and leave all these. You don't make it come to pass. You wait on God. You Very wait good. on God, yes. For those of you that didn't hear, she said you don't make the words come to pass that come from God. You wait on God. God will bring them about. God will make it happen. Do you have something? No, I was just going to say one time, Scotty and I went to a prophet. You know, <clears throat> there again, it's more out of curiosity than anything else. Of course, they called couples up, you know, and they spoke and all this and afterwards Scotty and I kind of looked at each other like mm, I don't know about this <laughs> and they, they were supposedly recording all of these prophetic oh, yeah. things right. and mm -hmm. when we plugged ours in and listened to it it was just blank oh that's wild well okay see that kind of stuff just gets real dangerous real fast oh, yeah. Yeah. it gets real askew real fast okay a couple of things of course Ber Burl is um Repeating what you said, go back to the last thing you heard from Kenneth E. Hagin yeah. and act on it. Yeah. Um, people, uh, Burrell says, people, especially in the United States, do not know how to get still. Mm -hmm. People here are extremely busy, and you realize it when you go to other countries. Mm -hmm. And Carl says, the first nine chapters of Proverbs are all about getting knowledge and wisdom from listening Seeking God, yes. We're, we're going to get into that yes. in just a second, my brother. Okay, so that's that's all the commentary, okay. and I told you Lisa's with us. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Joel has a question. All right. No, Saul. Saul. Yes, uh -huh. sir. King Saul. Mm -hmm. No, he didn't. Just to let go. There's a lot of truth to that. He will. He will let you. He will let you have your own way. He will let you do your mm -hmm. own thing if that's what you insist on. That's doing. right. That's the wisdom from a nine-year-old. That's right. You're absolutely right. That's the right. wisdom from a nine-year-old. You are correct. But this is a nine-year-old that's been brought up in the things of God. Yeah. Big in the difference. spirit of God. Big that's difference. the difference. Yeah. That's the difference. All right. Let's pick it up at verse six. 
It says, And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that has a familiar spirit, uh -oh. <laughs> that I may go to her, inquire of her. And his servants mm -hmm. said unto him, Behold, there is a woman that has a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment, and he went and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits, and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life, to cause me to die? And Saul sware to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up, Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For you are Saul. Now, you need to realize, first of all, what familiar spirits are. Familiar spirits, there, there's a lot of things that familiar spirits do, but one of the things that they do is they impersonate the dead. That's what ghosts are. Ghosts are not the, the spirits of the dearly departed. Mm -hmm. Ghosts are demonic spirits that imitate the dead. They, there's a lot... That, I don't have time to get into all the stuff on familiar spirits, but familiar spirits in a lot of ways are Satan's reconnaissance. They gather information on people. They will follow people around. In a lot of ways, they are, they are the, the counterfeit of the guardian angel. But they will gather information on people. And what happens when a person dies, many, many times those familiar spirits will imitate <laughs> them as ghosts. And they will imitate them many times in the places where they lived for a very long time and so forth. We, we, when we lived in Oklahoma, it, this is a long story, but we, we um, moved into a house in Oklahoma, and the, the lady that owned it was in the nursing home, and her daughter rented it to us. All right, eventually the lady died. The old lady died. All her stuff was locked up in a room upstairs. We couldn't even get in there. Only the family had a key to Mama's stuff. And the way the... The way the house was built, our bedroom was underneath this room where all the stuff was. And after Mama died, we, there was a couple of nights that, that we, we went to bed. We're laying there in bed, and we started hearing stuff scooting across the floor. And we start hearing voices. We start hearing a rocking chair going back and forth. People laughing and talking. Uh, yeah. As real as we're talking. Yeah. You couldn't make out the you words, but you sounded like they were dragging the bed in a chest or whatever across yeah. the floor. It sounded just like you they were dragging all. furniture across and, the floor. And what we thought, well, maybe the family came in. We thought, well, not at ten thirty, eleven at night. Maybe the family came in getting some <laughs> and stuff. They and they would have told yeah. us. If yeah. They yeah. Were so anyway, we go in there. We woke up there. No, the doors locked. Everything. We go back downstairs, <laughs> lay down, and we listen. They're talking, and I, finally I realized what it was, and I start laughing. We because, both did. We got just because tickled. The, the spirits that had followed this old lady around, they came back to the place that was familiar. Mm -hmm. And all her stuff was there. So I started laughing. I took authority over it. In the name of Jesus commanded them to leave, and it quit whenever I had any more trouble. Stopped with it. immediately. Stopped immediately. Listen, you don't have to be afraid of ghosts and all that kind of stuff. It's a bunch they, of It's a bunch of hooey. Sit. They can't Silly. they can't hurt you. They can't do anything uh -huh. to you. They can make you hurt yourself yeah. if you're afraid of them. But the key issue is stay out of fear. Mm -hmm. They can't do anything to you. Mm -hmm. Anyway, okay. And when and when the family finally did come to get in that room to get mama's stuff, we could hardly wait to look in there cuz we just knew the room would be totally in shambles. In, you know, just in disarray. <laughs> It was perfectly in order. Yeah. Those spirits had just, it made it sound like there was a house full of people up there. Yeah. Nothing was out of order. But now watch this. 
this woman, this woman is a witch. She knows familiar spirits. She's dealt with them for years. But in this particular situation, notice what happened. Verse 12 says, And when the, woman saw, when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. She freaked out. Now why did she freak out? Because this wasn't a familiar spirit. God stepped in and intervened. This wasn't a familiar spirit. This was Samuel. And it about blew her cork. <laughs> I mean, she about came from together. But now notice this. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice, and the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, Now the king James says, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. Now the word gods there is the word Elohim. The word Elohim is translated thousands of times in the Old Testament as the word God. But it is also used in the Old Testament as the it's translated as judge who is a representative of God. So it could have been translated when he, she said, What do you see? Uh, said, And the woman said unto Saul, I saw a judge ascending out of the earth. That's what Samuel was. Samuel was judge over Israel. He was a judge... And he was a prophet. Let's keep reading. Said, I saw a judge ascending out of the earth, and he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? Now that's interesting. We got uh -huh. into this. We got into this Sunday. Um, in the Old Testament, when the righteous died, they didn't go to heaven. Nobody went to heaven until Jesus was raised from the dead. But there was a place in the middle of the earth called Abraham's bosom, or paradise. You can read about it in Luke chapter 16, the story of rich, the rich man and Lazarus. Um, the rich man died and went into what was called Gehenna, that place of torment. Lazarus was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now you can read that in Luke 16. There was a gulf between... Well, phew, it's Bible study. Let's look it up. <laughs> Let's have Bible study. Let's have Bible study. <laughs> okay. Hold your place there in First Samuel. Don't, don't lose it. We're going to come right back to it. I wanted to just touch on that, but let's go ahead and do this out of Luke. You can see this. Luke chapter 16. Are y'all learning anything? Verse 19. <laughs> y'all are not saying anything online. Because they're listening. They're learning. Luke, Luke 16. 16. Verse 19. I want you to just see this about Abraham's bosom said there was a rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now this was, again, this was not heaven. You can read in John chapter 1, it says in John 1, I believe 1.18, it says, No man has gone up to heaven. In the Old Testament, they didn't go to heaven. They went to mm -hmm. Abraham's bosom. It says, It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Well, his body was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes. Gehenna, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the ting, fing, tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that you in your lifetime received good things, likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, you are tormented. Besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, 
neither can they pass on pass to us that would come from thence. So there is a gulf between these two compartments. The righteous dead in the Old Testament were there. Those that were in torment were in hell. When Jesus was raised from the dead, he led captivity captive. He emptied that place. And now the Old Testament saints are in heaven. They're there now. Now, I don't have time to get into it, but when a, when a righteous Jew dies, he goes back to that place. But that's for another time. Anyway. I don't know at what point that Carl asked this. He said, wait, didn't Satan at this time have the keys to paradise? No. No. No, he did not. He had authority over death and hell. He did not have the keys to paradise. But Jesus stripped him of those keys. Jesus said in Revelation 1.18, he said, I have the keys of hell and of death. Okay? So, and the, the keys that, that, that Satan carried actually was a, Adam's authority originally. Jesus took it back. Okay. 1 Samuel 28 again. All right, verse 14. Oh, verse 15. Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? So again, we're talking about Abraham's bosom. Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me. God is departed from me and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Neither have I... Therefore I have called thee that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. Then said Samuel, Wherefore thou... Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, saying, The Lord is departed from thee and has become thine enemy? God won't talk to you. What makes you think I will? I like that. You know, I like it. Um, says, And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me, for the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand and given it to thy neighbor, even to David, and he begins to, and he goes on to tell him, he said, by this time tomorrow you'll be with me. In other words, you'll be, uh, you will be dead. So, in this, Saul disobeyed God, he's lost the kingdom, he's refused to repent, he's refused to hear, and he's turned to the occult. How do you spell Saul? S-A-U-L. So, he's at that point. Now, I've said all this to get to this point, uh, to come to this place. Um, Lord, help me with this. Um, man was created to walk in the supernatural, with God. He was made that way. He was created that way. Um, but you need to realize, and again, I don't know if I'm dealing with this because of, of Halloween coming up in a month. I don't know if there's if somebody's going to be watching, with, watching this dealing with issues with the occult, but I'm just going to lay it out there the way the Lord gave it and let the chips fall where they may. But it's important that you understand. Yes, man was created to walk with God on a supernatural level, but you need to realize that there are two supernatural realms in the earth. Yes. There is the supernatural of God, and there is the supernatural of Satan. Mm -hmm. There is the supernatural of God that operates in the spirit realm. Now, Satan is a spirit. He is a fallen angelic being. But the supernatural realm of Satan is a counterfeit of the spirit realm. And that counterfeit of the spirit realm is called, in the, in the, the Greek word would be suke, P-S-U-C-H-E, suke. Uh, we get our word psychic from it. Satan's supernatural works in the psychic realm, and it is a counterfeit of the realm of the spirit. One of the lies of the occult is that, that there is only one source of power, and that's not true. 
In reality, there are two sources of power. There is power that comes from God, but there is satanic power. It is out there. Um, I've heard people make the statement, well, you know, Satan can't do anything. He doesn't have any power. I've heard people make the statement, well, Satan can't heal anybody. Sure he can. Mm-hmm. Sure he can. He gave the sickness to begin with. Yeah, exactly. He gave the sickness to begin with. And I remember reading a book by by uh, Gordon Lindsay who started Christ for the Nations. In fact, our our friend that we've known for 30 years is now the director of Christ for the Nations, John Holler. Um, but he made, Gordon, Brother Lindsay talked about this in this book. He said there was a woman, uh, I believe it was in South America, that was dying of some disease and nobody could figure out what in the world is wrong with this woman. And a healer came by, probably something like a curandera, something like that, came by and he told the girl, little girl, he said, told her parents, said, you wear, have this little girl wear this amulet, she'll be okay. So they put this little amulet, this little necklace thing on her. And within a few days, she was fine. I mean, she was at death's door, and within a few days, she was good to go. Well, every time she would take the amulet off, she'd get sick again. Put it on, she was okay. Finally, somebody had the intelligence to, it's kind of like a locket thing, had the intelligence to open it up and see what was in there. Inside this little thing was a little note. We took it out and read it, and it was a poem. It said, Satan... Please keep her body well that we might take her soul to hell. So like, kind of like what you're saying. If if Satan can bring the sickness and disease by demonic power, he can, he can, take he it back. can withdraw it. Mm-hmm. Because sometimes it is to his advantage. And we're going to talk about that why in just a second. Um, as far as the occult is concerned, you have no reason to fear it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely no reason to be afraid of the occult whatsoever. But you do have to know what your authority is, mm-hmm. and you do need to know how to use it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But now, I, and I've got this on the screen. You can you can follow it on the screen if you would like. But um, or you may want to look this up in your Bible. But I want you to notice this: Galatians chapter five, verse nineteen. Galatians 5, beginning in verse 19, lists the work of the flesh. I think this is very interesting. It says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Witchcraft. Hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness, (laughs) <laughs> revelings and such like of the which I tell you before as I also tell you in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God the thing I want to bring to your attention is witchcraft is one of the works of the flesh it is a work of the flesh it is not a work of the spirit it is a work of the counterfeit spirit realm which is the suke psychic realm and I remember back in the 70s you remember this when we got baptized in the Holy Ghost Back then, it seemed like everybody was afraid of the witches. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and they came out with Rosemary's Baby and and um, what was that other movie? That demonized girl. Mm, I don't remember. You know, anyway, I can't. Oh, The Exorcist. Yeah. You know, they came out with all those movies. <laughs> all the witches, all the Satanists, they're going to take over. They're not going to take over. It's a work of the flesh. Mm-hmm. They can't take over. You might as well get just as bent out of shape. And, ah, all the drunks are going to take over. <laughs> no, they're not. I don't know. It kind of feels like it sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear God. All the adulterers are going to take over. No, they're not. <laughs> all of that is a work of the flesh. Now, somebody said, yes, but there's power in witchcraft. Sure there is. Because witchcraft works on spiritual principles, but it can never last because it is a work of the flesh. And kind of like you you said earlier today, the biggest element in witchcraft is the mouth. 
the reason witchcraft works, it is rooted in the fundamental concept of believing with the heart, mm -hmm. paying with the mouth. Mm -hmm. That's why it works. And it will do, witchcraft will do everything it can to imitate Christianity. Mm -hmm. I mean, where do you think words like abracadabra, alakazam come from? Yeah. It's a counterfeit of tongues. Mm -hmm. See? Well, and while we... We grew up with the movie uh, Mary Poppins. I mean, you know, that was popular yeah. when we were little. And when Nicole was little, we were going to let her watch Mary Poppins. And I mean, and this was probably, she wasn't, what, three years old, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I mean, immediately the Spirit of God alerted both of us and made us to understand supercalifragilisticexpialidocious was part of an incantation. Well, how many of us went around singing supercalifragilisticexpialidocious even though the sound of it is something quite atrocious? We sang it because it was part of a little movie and it was cute and it was hard to say and once you learned to say it, it was fun to say it. Yeah. And the whole thing about Mary Poppins, she was a witch. witch. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> <laughs> so, it, Satan will use such subtle things to get mm -hmm. that introduced. And I'm sorry, no, 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 I took it off on a that, side. That, that's absolutely, absolutely the truth. Yeah. And I guess part of why the Lord's having me go this direction, uh, and you illustrated it, is it's time to get our antennas up mm -hmm. and pay attention. Yeah. Um, let me give you three things or... Uh, three ways or three objectives that Satan has in using the counterfeit of the occult. Um, first of all, he will try to use his counterfeit to feed the spiritual hunger of the rebellious or the ignorant. See, Saul was in a place of rebellion. Mm -hmm. God quit talking to him. There was a time he was walking with a supernatural God and then he came to a place because of his rebellion. God quit talking and it created a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And Satan came in and filled that vacuum not only, did, not only with that evil spirit when the anointing was transferred to David but also in him going to that witch. Mm -hmm. He created a vacuum. So it will create a... People are hungry for the supernatural. Mm -hmm. And it will create a vacuum either through for the rebellious or the ignorant. I remember when I was 14, I'd gotten born again when I was 14 years old. And my heart was hungry for the supernatural. And I, I you know, I never had, I was raised in a denominational church that, that extremely conservative. And, you know, I had no no concept that you could have a relationship with a supernatural God today. None whatsoever. But I got born again and I came across John fourteen twelve. Jesus said, The works that I do shall ye do also. Greater than these shall ye do because I go to my Father. I was just a 14 year old kid and I had a little, I'd been given a little, uh, back then it was called the Living Bible, one of those paraphrase things. And I was reading that and I thought, Doing the works of Jesus. And I became hungry for the supernatural. And I knew God, no, now God was leading me. But um, I went to my pastor of the particular denomination I was in. And I, I got the Bible. I said, what about this? And he said, all of that's passed away. It's all passed away. I'm thinking, well, you know, he's smarter than I am. I'm a 14-year-old kid, seminary grad, pastor, you know. Sure, he knows the Bible better than I do. But now listen, here's what I thought. I thought, well, okay, I know I'm born again. I know I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven when I die. I know that. All right, that's settled. Now, but if there's no supernatural power available in the church, I'm going to find it. Now, I didn't approach it from a moral 
issue. I just if if there is not supernatural working of God's power in the church, I'm going to find it. Jesus said, "Works that I do, shall you do also? Greater things shall you do." I went down to the local library, 14 year old kid. I checked out a stack of books, without exaggeration, that tall, on spells, witchcraft, the occult, astral projection, hypnotism, all I mean, just all kinds of stuff. Whole stack of them sitting on my dresser. And I thought, well, you know, I'll start studying this. And again, I in my own mind it was it was from the standpoint of ignorance of you know, I didn't I didn't associate all that with the devil. I just thought, well, you, know, you wanted power. I wanted power, and I thought, yeah, I know, I know, witchcraft was supposed to be like of the devil, but you know, I heard there was good witches and there was bad witches. So you were going to be a I good was, one. I was going to be a good witch. <laughs> I was going to be. A good you were going to be Mary Poppins. I was. Yeah. I was. I was. I was going to be a good witch. And witch old wick, uh, witch. Witch. <laughs> the wicked witch. You know. <laughs> I would be a good witch and be nice to people and help people. Unless you cross me, then I would kill you. <laughs> and then I would be a bad one. <laughs> you know, but, but that, I mean, that just, I was hungry for power. Yeah. And long story short, I got those books. One, you got a two-week checkout period, a period from the library. And between the time that I got those books and the time they were due, I had gone to a Derek Prince meeting, gotten baptized in the Holy Ghost, and never read any of them. <laughs> so, and God met me where I was, and I was sitting in that meeting. I didn't, I'd never heard of the Holy Ghost, never heard of tongues, never heard of any of it. I was sitting there in the meeting, and he he taught on deliverance. I never heard anything like that, and that's a long story in itself. But I he taught the, on demons and deliverance. Taught on demons and deliverance, <laughs> and at the end of the meeting. I was sitting there and I said, God, I don't know what these people have, but whatever, but whatever it is, I want it. Next thing I knew, I was standing up and praising the Lord in other tongues. Nobody laid hands on me. Nobody touched me. Nobody did anything. And God met me where I was, thank God. And because of the ignorance, I mean, He just stepped in and moved. But how many people it goes the other way? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh that they see that there is no power in the church, they see that there is no supernatural in the church, well, if there's not power there, then I'll go somewhere else. And they don't, they don't associate it from a moral standpoint. It's just, I need power in my life mm-hmm. from some source. So, we got any comments? Or? No comments, but that makes me think of that woman on, I don't know what channel it is, that she's a... She talks to the dead. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I can't uh, think what her name is. Some, yeah. Uh, she's blonde headed, and um, she talks to, and she picks it up by familiar spirits, of course, and they give you know she has messages for people from their yeah, New Island. Uh, 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 well, I don't Long remember. Island Medium or something. Yeah, Long Island Medium. Anyway. You can tell we've watched it. <laughs> I can give you just enough of it that you know who I'm talking about. Um, people are fascinated with that because it's accurate. Mm-hmm. And people are drawn to that because there seems to be healing in it and there seems to be restoration in it and there seems to be, you know, they get their peace, you know. Exactly. And that brings me to a thought that I had a while ago, Kenneth, when you were speaking in all of those books, but the Lord knew your heart. He yeah, knew the Lord knew my heart. You weren't looking for the occult, but you weren't looking for mm-hmm. the opposite. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You were trying to find the truth of, of yeah. the matter. Yeah. And this was the only place you knew where to start. Well, he had enough trust or, or belief or whatever in you. That he wasn't going to let that happen. Yeah, he, yeah. Mm-hmm. he was looking way out in the future. He was mm-hmm. seeing what yeah. was going to be done. Some, somebody was praying somewhere. I was going to say, but let's give some credit. It wasn't your mom and daddy for sure. No. We know. No. We won't even go there. But his grandma Hyatt 
was a praying Pentecostal woman. Mm -hmm. I think that's where the connection yeah, it was. May, may very may may mm -hmm. very well have yeah. been. Mm -hmm. But here's here's the deal. Let me make this statement again. Satan will try to use the counterfeit to feed the spiritual hunger of the rebellious or the ignorant. And let me deal with the ignorant for a little bit. Cindy made reference to it with uh, Mary Poppins. Mm -hmm. Listen, guys, listen. Don't you realize that Harry Potter and all that other junk mm. is nothing but primers for the occult? That's Don't right. you realize that? That's right. All of that stuff is training children for the occult. You remember, do you remember the show in the 60s, Bewitched? Mm -hmm. You remember that show? Uh, a guy that I met back in the 70s, he got to where he was pretty pretty good-sized ministry and pretty famous, a guy by the name of Mike Warnicke. Mm -hmm. Mike... Mike had a very, uh, Mike, uh, Mike was got very high up in the Satanist church, mm -hmm. uh, and he wrote a book about his testimony and stuff. I mean, he could do he could do stuff. He could call fire down from heaven and did it. Burned a couple of places up. I mean, did it. This guy knew his business, and I met him. He's one of the nicest guy you ever want to meet. But anyway. Uh, he got born. He got born again. Uh -huh. Baptized in the Holy Ghost. Got delivered. Start, actually, started spilling a lot of the beans on things that that Satanists do. Uh, and in fact, for a long time, he ministered as a kind of like Mark Lowry ministered as a Christian comedian. Right. And very, very funny. Ministered to a lot of people coming out of the occult. But the thing that started him again, he was he was earnestly hungry for power. The thing that started him in the occult, he would every week turn on his television and watch Bewitched and make notes. That became his primer. Wow. That became his primer for the occult. Well, just this cute little neat show. No, mm -hmm. it is training for the occult. Mm -hmm. And it's gotten a whole lot worse and a lot, whole lot more blatant with mm -hmm. stuff like Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter and, mm -hmm. and all of that other stuff. But it is Satan trying to use the counterfeit mm -hmm. to satisfy that void for the mm -hmm. rebellious and for the ignorant, number mm -hmm. one. Anybody got anything? Okay, Lisa H. Is that why sometimes when you meet someone, you feel like you have met them before or already know them? Familiar spirits? It could be familiar spirits. That's a possibility. Or, you've heard of the term deja vu. I believe, and I, I've, I've had this happen either through dreams, but I believe particularly when you're asleep and your body and mind is quieted down, I believe many times your spirit can see into the future and into the past mm -hmm. because it's in that timeless realm. And I think there are things we pick up in our spirits where our future is concerned, mm -hmm. and you and it may not necessarily be with an individual. You walk into a place and you feel like I've been there before. I've done this before. Yeah. So it it could be something mm -hmm. like that. I had the Lord tell me years ago. He said many times when you're in a particularly uh, transitional situation, many times the Lord will give you those as as signposts that you're on the right track. So it's not necessarily familiar spirit. Not necessarily a bad thing. Yes, ma'am. Familiar spirit is Satan's way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God sends us kindred spirits. That's a good word. Very good. If you didn't hear that, she said, a familiar spirits is Satan's way, kindred spirits is God way. Mm -hmm. God's way. That's excellent. Because I, I, me and you, right. mm -hmm. we relate right. and feel the We same have thing. kindred spirit, yeah. exactly. But it's mm -hmm. of God. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. It's not founded exactly witchcraft yeah demonic and that yeah. may be what she was asking about a source of familiarity uh-huh yeah. she was could be, be uh-huh kindred spirit rather than the right. pay 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 attention to the connection in fact after church sunday we talked a little bit about this pay attention when you feel connected to people pay attention as to why yes mhm mm pay attention as to why because um on the negative side, um, for example, if you get two people together that both of them have a victim mentality, everybody's done them wrong, everybody's treated them wrong, uh, they've had, 
you know, dealt a bad hand in life, whatever. But you take two people that have a victim mentality, they will get together, and it, that victim mm-hmm. mentality can become the basis of fellowship. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it can connect two people together. And what they will do is sit there and whine and cry the blues about how both of them have been mistreated. Mm-hmm. So that's a very dangerous thing. Mm-hmm. You can you can have a situation where two people come together uh, because of a common enemy. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can have we we talked about this at church Sunday. It's amazing to me how many people will become bedfellows with one another when they're they have a common enemy, and uh, and they otherwise would not give each other the time of day. Mm-hmm. And you get the enemy out of the way. Their 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 friendship will be destroyed because they will both have a selfish agenda in there somewhere, and so they will become enemies. Mm-hmm. Now, all of that is the satanic counterfeit, and this, and this goes back to what you were saying. Satan can create alliances. Yes. Okay, he can create alliances, mm-hmm. but he can't establish unity. He can't. Nope. Say that again, and and hear this well, and write it down. Satan can establish alliances, but he cannot create unity. Alliances can come from a common experience or a common enemy, but unity comes from a common vision. That's important. Unity comes from a common vision. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, we've got a couple of things. Okay. Trixie says, Erica gets so upset with me when I don't grant her permission to see or read, etc., any of the Harry Potters or the like. I wouldn't even allow Narnia. That being said, it never crossed my mind about Mary Poppins. <laughs> 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 Most people didn't. And, and if you go, especially way back when, it was so subtle. Pretty much everything Disney had oh, which, Disney has tons of witchcraft. Witchcraft is woven all through Disney stuff. Yeah, absolutely. All through it. Okay, and Carl says, television is a huge distraction that Satan uses anyway. Mm-hmm. I know that Christians use the media also for their ministry, but the majority of TV is to get people hooked on a program and draw people away from relationship with God. Mm-hmm. Yes, and as... um uh, 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 with each other, yeah. Yeah. Uh, way back, way back, what was the name of the show? Three's Company. Mm-hmm. Uh, now it's just silly, goofy. It's it, considered tame. It's considered very, very tame and acceptable, understood. But when it first came out, it was very risque, very risque. All right. We liked the show. Now this was what, in the... Late 70s, came early out, 80s? came out in 72 or 3. Oh, in the early 70s early then. 70s. Okay, all right. It's a long time ago. Um, and we were watching it one day. We liked it. And laughing. And the Lord spoke to Kenneth and he said, Be careful what you laugh at. He said, Whatever Satan can get you to laugh at, you will accept. Mm-hmm. Now, you fast forward that many 40 years, 40 mm-hmm. plus years, look at what people laugh at. Yeah, if, look at what we laugh at. If he can bury, if he can bury it in, a humor, in, a, in an agenda of humor, yeah. if Satan can bury his agenda in humor, it's easier to accept. Mm-hmm. And it becomes just, that's just the way people are. Mm-hmm. That's just the way life is. And it becomes acceptable. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Um, Anything else? Let's see. Trixie. Hey, now, <laughs> the the early 70s weren't that long ago. <laughs> well. <laughs> I agree with you, dear. All right. Number two. Satan will try to use the counterfeit to convince people of damnable satanic doctrines. And that goes back to what we were talking about, that little girl getting well in South America. But here's a... Here's a a scripture on it, a couple of scriptures on it. Okay. While you're looking them up, Carl says, "Man, toe smashing truth, <laughs> toe smooshing truth." <laughs> smooshing. 
that's that's even worse. That's worse. Not smashing, okay. smooshing. Second, all right. Second Thessalonians two eight through ten says, and then talking about the Antichrist, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. The deceivableness of unrighteousness is dealing with false teachings, false doctrines, new age, all of that kind of junk. Satan will use that stuff to convince people it's the legitimate thing. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. So, again, Satan will use that as a means to convey false doctrine. You can actually trace that back to the Garden of Eden. Eden. When Satan showed up in the Garden, the Bible says that he came in the serpent's body. The word serpent in the Hebrew is nakash, which literally means shining one. He came in with all the razzle-dazzle. Was it supernatural? Yes. Mm -hmm. They didn't go around talking to snakes in the Garden of Eden. They didn't talk to the animals. It wasn't Dr. Doolittle. They did not talk to the animals in the Garden. Man was the only one that was given speech in the Garden. This was a supernatural manifestation. And because it was done in such a way, the Shining One came in. Eve was deceived by what he said but it was accepted because it was supernatural it was accepted because it was supernatural so again satan will use the supernatural or his counterfeit to bring in satanic doctrine number three satan will use satanic doctrine to scare people out of spiritual things if he can make you afraid of the supernatural. That's why for the life of me, for the life of me, I cannot figure out why people go to scary movies. Mm -hmm. Mm -mm. It's fun to be scared. It's demonic to mm -hmm. be scared. And why you would open yourself up to that, I have absolutely no clue. But Satan will use that uh, as it's portrayed in films and all that kind of stuff. He will use it to make people afraid mm -hmm. of supernatural things. Mm -hmm. Well, I think most people go to scary, really scary movies because it's some sort of... They have... They've made it through. They got through this scary, scary thing, and I'm okay. I didn't lose my mind. I didn't, you know, <laughs> nothing got me. I'm. It's, it's like a, uh, they get a, you know. Uh, but you go back and you, you listen to Rick Renner's testimony. He opened the door to a spirit of fear by going to right. scary movies. Mm-hmm. And it took him years to get rid of that thing. Yeah. He was afraid of the dark. He was afraid of, of being alone. He was afraid. Of, mm -hmm. And it all began with going to a scary movie marathon thing mm -hmm. that he went to on Halloween night. Yeah. And opening yourself up to fear is just ridiculous. To purposefully make yourself afraid is just stupidity. But, but Satan, Satan will... It's yeah, stupidity. It mm -hmm. Satan, will, Satan will use is counterfeit to try to scare people out of spiritual things. And I'll tell you, one of the things that you need that is a that is a telltale sign is when the, the supernatural is presented as this uh <laughs> twilight zony do 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 you know, weird sort of a crazy sort of a realm that uh you know you don't know what's gonna happen next because it's just mm -hmm. So wild and crazy. That is not the true realm of the Spirit. That is not the way the realm of the Spirit operates and functions. Not at all. And you say the word, uh, it's not suedo. Pseudo. 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 Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. you, you can't live it unless it's. 
Mm-hmm. And God's not yeah. like that. God, God is not is, like that. And uh, when I was putting the notes together for this today, let me tell you something. When you come across Christians that try to make the realm of the Spirit, try to make God things that way, it's not, it's not God. Mm-mm. God is not... And let me tell you something. When you come across Christians that try to function in the supernatural that way, where the things of God are concerned, you're going to have a discipline problem on your hands. Yes, you are. Ask me how I know. <laughs> We've been around that mountain a few times. Now, here's what happens is, is when you when you get somebody that's just kind of looney tunes where the things of God are concerned and just kind of <laughs> and squirrely, when you try to bring correction, well, you just don't understand. You're just not on my level. You're not well, this is how level. God leads me. Yeah. Yeah, and you start making up stuff so you can look supernatural. Woo. Mm-hmm. What you've done then is opened yourself up to a spirit, mm-hmm. and they'll give you a show. Yeah, you'll get, you'll have a show. Yeah, absolutely. But then you've got yourself a little tiger by the tail. Yeah, that's what you've got. The realm of the spirit, the mm-hmm. God realm of the spirit, is a disciplined, ordered, precise realm. Mm-hmm. Okay, we've got to go back. Lisa needs you to repeat the statements. Okay. Okay. Number one, Satan will try to use the counterfeit to feed spirit, the spiritual hunger and rebellion. Pardon me, let me say it again. He will try to use the counterfeit to feed the spiritual hunger of the rebellious or the ignorant. Number two, he will try to use the counterfeit to convince people of damnable satanic doctrines. And number three, he will use the counterfeit to, to scare people out of spiritual things. So, how do you tell the difference? How do you know the difference between the real and the true? Well, since I didn't put it in here where you could see it, let's look it up. Okay. Hebrews 4, what? Go Lisa, to Hebrews 4.12. Lisa says they go to the scary movies... For the heart-pumping thrill, Brenda says this is quite alarming, but for me it is a warning. Good, good. Um, makes her. Well, there's wa- a lot of ways you can have a heart-pumping thrill without scaring yourself. <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, makes Brenda want to pray a lot. Carl says, "Where did the term God works in mysterious ways come from?" So, you can answer that after you do that. The Lord moves in mysterious ways. Where did the term God works in mysterious ways come from? Look it up in your concordance, brother. (laughs) I'll look it up in my concordance, all right? I'll do that in a minute. Hebrews 4.12. How are you going to know the difference? How do you know the difference between the real and the false? Hebrews 4.12 For the Word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any Mm two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the suke, the soul, the psychic, and the spirit. There's a lot of talk about spiritual, spiritual portals. Let me tell you something. This is your spiritual portal. This is your standard right here for discerning what is spiritual and what is not. Mm -hmm. This is it right here. This is the standard. This is the criteria. It is the Word of God. Now, I do have this written down. Galatians 1, verses 8 and 9, says Paul is speaking. He says, but though we... Or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than which, what you have, what we, which we have preached unto you? Let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again: If any man preach any other gospel unto you other than that you have received, let him be accursed. Now that's important. He said, if an angel shows up, razzle dazzle, whoo! Let's compare that to the Word. Mm -hmm. 
If a man shows up, well, I've had a dream. I've had a vision. Yeah, but what does that say? Mm-hmm. It's got to, has to go with right. the Word. Mm-hmm. This is the discernment right here between what is supernatural and what is not. Think about it for a minute. When Jesus was raised from the dead, what did He do when He appeared to the disciples? Preach the Word. Mm-hmm. He didn't just show up. Now, he did to Thomas, look at my hands and my feet, because that's what Thomas said. But when he showed up, this is what the Word says concerning me. He preached the Word to him. This is the deciding thing right here. Brother Hagin, in his ministry, Jesus would appear to him. Lord, I never heard that before. Could you show me Scripture on that? Mm -hmm. This is your deciding factor right here. Mm -hmm. This is it. Okay. Mm-hmm. We got any questions or comments? Uh-uh. Okay, we're just about done. The key issue. Let's back up to First Samuel 15. First Samuel 15, verse 22. It says, and Samuel said. That the Lord is great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. I guess basically the whole crux of what I've shared with you tonight boils down to one thing. Set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Mm -hmm. And it depends on what you choose to do with your ears. The most important thing you can give to God is your ears. Mm -hmm. Give them in sacrifice. Lord, I'm ready to hear your voice. I will hear. I will obey. Mm -hmm. And in your obedience, the blessing of God will begin to work. It will begin to operate in your life. And in the blessing is supernatural. It's in the blessing. Now, I'm... You're done? I'm good. Lisa A. says she doesn't go to scary movies because she won't submit herself to that. Very good. Um, Lisa H. says, I had someone who is a believer tell me that there are things in the Bible that man has changed in order to control people. But God is not a God of confusion. Okay, I don't understand her, her comment. Um, her, her. That evidently this person may be is um, maybe discounting the Bible because people have changed it in order to control people? Hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, here's, here's, here's one of the things that's interesting about the Bible. Uh, any kind of a moron that would make that statement, and if you're watching, sir, you're a moron, uh, <laughs> anybody that would make that statement's never read it. Mm-hmm. Because if you read the Bible and you read it honestly and you read it sincerely, it will become very apparent that if a man had the opportunity to write it, he never would have written it to begin with. It's very very apparent that it is God-inspired. And it's like Derek Prince used to say, he said, if you start reading the Bible, the Bible will start reading you. Mm -hmm. And you will realize this is a God book. This isn't a man book. This is a God book. And like Derek Prince in his testimony, he was not in he was in the British Army. He had he had no opportunity to go to a church. He had no chaplain. He said the chaplains cussed worse than anybody. That's sad. It is sad. But he said he said he had nobody he could go to as a pastor. He had no church. He had nothing but a Bible. So there was no way that an outside human influence mm-hmm. could have used it to manipulate him. All he did was read the book. And that is the testimony of probably thousands of people that have been in positions of that's all they had was just the Bible. And God absolutely transformed their lives by supernatural Mm -hmm. power. So, no, there is no way that this has been manipulated and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And the Bible will confirm itself. Mm Mm-hmm. The book of Deuteronomy says, At the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Um, Every verse of Scripture in the Bible will reconfirm itself. Exactly. Every single one of them. She says, My thought is, God is not a God of confusion. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, First Corinthians fourteen thirty three. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Amen. All right. Anybody else? No, that's it. Okay. And where there's strife, there is confusion, and every mm-hmm. evil mm-hmm. work. Well, I think mm-hmm. part of the um, part of me sharing this kind of, and Brenda actually kind of hit the nail on the head. Get your antennas up. Mm-hmm. Pay attention to what's going on. Exactly. Even something as simple as cartoons for your kids, mm-hmm. like the deal with Mary Poppins. Um, mm-hmm. pay yeah, and we weren't we weren't seeking the Lord about Mary Poppins. We were fixing to let them go watch it. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Because as far as we were concerned, it was an innocent kid's show. You know? Mm-hmm. But it was the Spirit of God that alerted us. So we need to be aware. Uh, Burl says, uh, Joseph Smith, founder of Mormon movement, claimed the Bible had been tampered with by the Catholics and was no longer trustworthy. Lisa says, good teaching tonight needed this time of year. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a very uh, spiritually active time of year. Yeah. And we are in on a... Bo- on both sides. On yes. The, on the Jewish calendar and on the satanic side of it. Yeah. So, we are in a very... Um, serious place in the things of God mm-hmm. in in time. Mm-hmm. Can I say something? Sure. Certainly. Absolutely. It, it makes you stop because you, you said the man called down fire. Mm-hmm. But that's what the Antichrist is going to do. Oh, absolutely. Is Antichrist will have... Mm-hmm. to desire? Our Holy Ghost has got to desire. Mm-hmm. 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 Just mm-hmm. because he called down fire doesn't make it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I'm not for sure if he even healed somebody in Revelation. Mm-hmm. I know that the, the thing that he is going to do is to draw people to him. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So what are we, where are we now? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? and, it, and it goes back to, like you said, the, the Holy Ghost. Cindy made reference to it. We have to learn to trust our spirits. Yeah. And in dealing with people, dealing with situations, yes. uh, there was there was a man that started... A church years ago in San Angelo and people tried for I don't know how long to try and get us hooked up and the Lord just kept saying no, 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 no. Oh, and everybody and kept it, saying to it, us, you have to go to this church. You have to go to, th- oh, this is, it was, and we just had, it was like a wall. It's like, no, God would not let us. And then you ended up, the Lord gave you a word about what would happen that is because this church went from 12 people to 600 in less than a year. And the Lord gave him a word and said, as quickly as it rose, it will fall. Growth is not a swelling. Yeah, and that's absolutely right. And that, that's, a, that's a good word. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Maxine says growth is not a swelling. A swelling. Mm-hmm. And, and it happened just like and of course, all the people that were insistent that we go to that church, and when Kenneth gave them that word, well, there were people that quit having anything to do with us because we were jealous. Because y'all just y'all are jealous, and y'all are intimidated by him. Well, then when the church did implode, like he said it was going to, um, then they were all kind of well, well. <laughs> well, well, one of the things that happened, there was a couple of women that came over to the house. This was this was in the early 80s. Came over to the house, or mid-80s. And um, you have to, you have to, you have to. He said, no, I don't. And I said, in four months, it'll be shut down. And they were running between four and 600 people. I said, in four months, it'll be shut down. Four months, it was gone. Mm-hmm. And that man, he, I won't even go into all the explanation of him. Um... We went to visit with the man. We finally decided, let's just go visit with the pastor and his wife. And we took them to lunch. And all we wanted to do was just kind of check our own spirit. See what, what's going on here. 
took them to lunch, had a nice visit over lunch. We went back to the church. We had no intention of doing anything. We were just kind of feeling things out. We walked in the building, and the pastor turned to Kenneth, and he said, I have nothing to give you. I have nothing to offer you except this church, and I'm not doing that. Get out of my church and don't come back. We're <laughs> like, okay, just wanted to take you to lunch. <laughs> just took you to lunch. That's all. <laughs> you know. And fast forward to when the church did collapse. Um, he had said, God, if what I'm saying and doing is not of you, shut my mouth. The next day, he had a massive stroke, and they said he didn't utter a word for seven months. What was the it fed all of the supernatural seekers. And so, anyway, mm-hmm. and that church crumbled, and it ended up hurting a lot of people. A lot of people. A lot of people got really hurt. Mm-hmm. So, okay, this, uh, we've got a few more comments, and then it's time to quit. Uh, Lisa says, become aware of what you watch and listen to, not in a fear-based careful, but in yeah. seeking the right way of the Lord mm-hmm. type of caution. Yes. yes. Brenda says, pray for spiritual awakening during this time. Yes. Lisa H., an elderly lady who was raised Catholic is who told me the Bible had been manipulated. She's been manipulated. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So that's all the comments. Well, um, oh, let me remind you, those of you that weren't online when I announced this earlier, we have set up a Facebook page set up specifically for the Seeds of Victory Global Bible Study family. If you would like to get on there, it is a secret web page. Nobody can get on there but us. Nobody can, can see it but us. And just for ministry to one another, body ministry to one another, just sharing posts, pictures, whatever. Uh, but go to the website. Go to our website, seedsofvictory.org. Get the information. Sign up. And then we will, as administrators, we will put you in and you can follow along. All the information is on the website. Go to it. Also, get the free uh, series that I can't remember the name of. Can't remember the name of. Uh, (laughs) For the month of October. And uh, go from there. Okay. Maxine, I'm so glad you and Joel joined us. Joel, I'm glad you came. And he even had questions and comments. He did. He wanted, he was taking notes. I'm impressed. Yeah. And Lucille, I'm so glad you came. Have fun at your horse thing this weekend. And everybody else, we are so glad y'all yes, join us every week. Us. It yes, is yes, such yes, a pleasure. Yes, yes. You are such a blessing, and we love y'all. Well, Father, in the name of Jesus, yes, we Lord. just bless everyone. Yes, Jesus. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. We release the spirit of wisdom mm-hmm. and revelation in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. We love you. See you next week. <laughs>